For the documentary series Researchers and Their Fields, 24 interviews with academics from Tilburg University were recorded. The interviews focused on the choices researchers make. What is high quality research and how do they strive to meet these criteria? To what extent do they engage with practice and theory to ground their work? What inspires and frustrates them? This documentary regards the use of theory in research. How do the interviewees decide where to start analyzing a massive data set? What guides them in trying to understand a new phenomenon? How does our understanding of a topic advance from a series of highly specialized studies? Theory is often a crucial part of the interviewees' answers. Is there um, a demarcation of what would be considered, say, good philosophical research versus bad philosophical research? Is there a criterion to what is a good, no, good philosophy? That's a good question, but it's very, also that's very difficult. Of course people will say this is bad philosophy, this is good philosophy, but you always see this from a certain angle. Uh, and this is a kind of a querel, which is interesting, so philosophers like to querel, not about political things, of li uh, things like that, but about what is good philosopher, what is good philosophy. Even, or especially in 20th, 21st century, uh, it's very hard to say, well, everybody thinks that this is a big philosopher. Some will say, well, it's this one, and others will say that one, and they, they both will not go together because they are excluding each other on all kinds of uh, uh, way of thinking and theories and outcomes and, and whatever. So that's very difficult. Uh, I think it is up, it's up to the philosopher to make the rules what philosophy is. And this is what you see in the history of philosophy. So um, every one of the big philosophers will say exactly not I am standing in a tradition and I'm elaborating no they will say you well you don't you do not understand what philosophy is but now I have something and this is real philosophy take a look at 17th century uh, there it really starts this this kinds of very fierce heavily even violating debates and that's great, because that's exactly what philosophy is. So, so philosophers build on each other's work, perhaps not so much um, by extending, but rather by criticizing. By criticizing, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it are, um, this criticism is very important, because that's exactly what, thi what is thinking. Thinking is, in a way, criticizing. Not only criticizing in a political or in the ethical or philosophical way, but as soon as I have, have a question, what, what exactly is this? Then I presuppose that there is a kind of an answer to it which might be wrong. So I, I will question it. So I, I will have a better look at it if you follow my theory. And then another will say, no, your, your theory is completely wrong. And uh, I have a better theory for that. That's the thing. So they are breaks in, in um, uh, uh, ruptures, there's a better word for it, ruptures. So uh, the history of philosophy is a, is a history of ruptures. Also in science, that's true, but not that revolutionary. I mean, you, you emphasized theory a couple of times. What is the role of theory in your work? Um, so I try to use different kinds of uh, theories or perspectives uh, to to make predictions about what we're likely to see in a given study. Um, so I think theories, um, although they often end up being wrong in some way or another, um, they, they kind of are the closest things we have to being able to see the future. So with a theory, if a, if a, if a theory working well for you, you can kind of plug in your variables of interest and the variables that the theory says are necessary, and you should be able to predict what you will see in, in your data. Um, and I think that's awesome. So you can just, it's like we don't, crystal balls aren't real, but you know, good theories are. And um, so then what's the point of doing the studies is in part to see, well, does this theory make uh, accurate prediction in this new domain? Um, and then also, if it doesn't, okay, that's useful to know because it suggests that maybe that's not the best crystal ball that we have mm -hmm. and we can 
uh, shine it a little bit more, get a new crystal ball or something like that. Th that almost suggests that we can mathematically model human behavior. I mean, maybe. I, I think that's it's tough. So um, there's um, uh, so like sometimes people talk about the hard sciences and the soft sciences, where uh, basically everything we do here at Tilburg is a variation on the soft sciences, right? Um, I'm kind of of the opinion that the soft sciences are actually a little bit harder than the, the hard sciences um, in terms of just the effort it takes to get all the variables in place. Um, so this is what makes theories difficult to make these kind of clear mathematical predictions about what we should expect from human behaviors, in part because just humans are so variable. And humans will learn about your theory and then adjust um, mm -hmm. based on what they've learned. So even over time, you might find that things kind of get a little bit wonky just because um, humans are annoying and learn about the things yeah. that you do. Yeah. Um, but um, I think there is some degree of truth to the idea that we can use mathematical principles and the principles that we learn and the studies that we have to make predictions about what we should likely see. And then yeah. the extent those are accurate and so on is part of what we're trying to figure out. Yeah. If, if, as you said, people learn um, about the theories and start to behave accordingly in, in some situations. In the, in the political sphere, that, that sounds almost dangerous. Um, in, the, um, in the philosophy of science um, sense, then you would say that then, then every theory that you propose in the end becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, so I mean, some of it depends, of course, whether it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, of course, depends if the people ever learn about your theory. So maybe you have better chance of this being uh, consistent over time if you never get your work out there, which mm -hmm. is kind of a paradoxical and not, yeah. <laughs> not super great incentive. Um, instead, I think, so there's, there's some interesting examples of people adopting behaviors and changing behaviors based on different scientific theories. I think a, a most recent example is, uh, so a variety of work came out showing that um, you could infer people's personality as well as their political beliefs and their religious beliefs from their Facebook profiles. So there are patterns of likes on, on Facebook. Um, and actually you could do this almost as well as, if once you have somewhere around 200 likes or something like that, um, you can use those to infer somebody's personality um, at the same rate as uh, if you ask their romantic partner to infer their personality. Um, it's pretty good. <laughs> Your romantic right. partner has a pretty good sense of who you are. Um, at least I hope so. Uh, and then, so that was the initial finding. And then there's also some work from uh, different areas of social psychology that finds that if you uh, frame a persuas persuasion attempt in d the direction of somebody's personality, they're a little bit more, they're more likely to work. So if you have somebody who's open to experience and more extroverted, this kind of, here, try this new party is going to work a little bit better than if you're very low in openness to experience and you're introverted. Right? Um, so this work kind of came out. And then what we saw is in the political domain, a variety, and actually just the advertisement domain in general, what they started to do is have very highly targeted advertisements on Facebook to uh, that or are aimed at matching not only your demographic profile, but also your personality in some way. Um, and then we've now seen the kind of backlash to this. Um, and so some of what GDPR and these different privacy regulations try to get at is trying to uh, at least allow people to have control over that personal data so that's not as possible. Um, and you see that um, now there are, uh, well, Facebook at least talks about as if they are maybe trying to cut down on this kind of advertising. And now we see scientists going back and saying, oh, OK, we can do all this stuff about inferring personality. Now, how do we get people to avoid these attempts um, that we're seeing in the real world? And so there is this kind of back and forth between um, society kind of learning about robust findings, making use of them, and then, well, this might cause a problem. It might not. But then, and then scientists reacting again to that to try to um, change things again. Uh, the theory is very relevant in the sense that, uh, especially in an area of, of big data where you have tons of variables that you potentially could put into uh, your model, uh, that theory helps you to select, first of all, what variables to consider. And if you don't have the data yet, what variables to try to collect additionally. So in terms of what goes into your model, that's very important. But second, it's also um, very important to be able 
to interpret your results. For example, suppose that you find a certain sign for a particular coefficient. Is this what, is this what you would expect in terms of what theory is predicting? Um, or if you find a certain size of the parameter estimates, is that what you would expect based on prior research? But uh, additionally, from a theoretical point of view, uh, what you always also try to determine is to find boundary conditions of where certain theories are uh, uh, getting towards their limit. Or under, so under what conditions will you find a, a more pronounced effect or will you find a less pronounced effect? We call that moderating effects or contingency relationships. And that's where theory uh, comes into play in that once you find some of those contingency factors that you must be able to determine uh, does that make sense or not. And of course there's always a big debate uh, what comes first, theory or, or empirics. I personally think that's an interplay between the two. First, theory inspires you in terms of what to incorporate into your models, but sometimes suppose that you consistently find across many different situations a certain uh, effect uh, that deviates from what conventional wisdom would predict, then it's maybe time to again go to the drawing board and to investigate maybe that theory is not yet perfect, maybe that theory needs to be adjusted in order to have a better match with what actually happens in, in, in practice. What is the role of theory in your work? Well, just to explain this, uh, so why does party system saturation not deter new pies from ent entry? I think there are different answers, because if you would focus on uh, on rational choice theory, that would be a very strange result because rational choice theory would say actors also groups. They have full information on their environment. They're rational. They want to uh, want to maximize the utility. They carefully weight, weight the cost and benefits. And only when the benefits are high than the costs, uh, they will do something. So in this case, yeah, also rational choice theory of entry well, would predict that parties, new parties, prospective entrants, they will know about the conditions, they will know this system is oversaturated, it's highly competitive, and, uh, uh, and that, yeah, so you should expect based on rational choice theory that they will not enter because they have lower chances of being successful in an oversaturated system. But on the other hand, other theories, bounded rationality theory, that's a critique on rational choice theory, it says, well, very often, uh, political actors, uh, individuals, well, they don't have full information, so it's really complicated to uh, what to weight costs and benefits and to infer, inf infer the likelihood of being successful. So instead of that, uh, organi uh, well, people they use proxies, and a proxy could, for instance, uh, be like if you see a lot of entry in the past elections. Well, apparently that suggests that there's a, a favorable breeding ground, so let's enter as well. And did that suggest that there is a, a list or a, a file cabinet of theories mm -hmm. and that you try to figure out what theoretical mechanisms best um, match reality or what you observe yeah. through um, kind of picking the theories that, um, that fit with the patterns that you observe? Yeah. Yeah, so the non-findings on entry it would not be consistent with rational choice theory, but it could be consistent with bounded rationality theory. What is the role of theory in your work? Very important. So theory guides my empirical prediction. So I'm an empiricist. I collect data to test theories. Notice the example that I showed you before. There is a class of theories that tells me that that is bad for bubble formation. Another class of theories that tells me that that is actually good in preventing the formation of a bubble. It's more likely with more debt, it's more likely we are able to bring back prices to fundamental. So theory guides me every time because it gives me the empirical prediction I want to find in the data. I'm looking in, in the data. I want to confirm with the data. Yeah. And does the empirics then also feed into new theory? Sometimes. Sometimes you may have facts that are not explained by the current theories. And as a result, you need to think about a new theoretical framework which is able to explain the previous facts and the new facts you are finding. Yeah. That's a typical undertaking in science, right? Both natural sciences and social sciences. Yeah. Yeah. But theories in the social sciences, or theory development in the social sciences, uh, varies in the extent to which theories can be reduced to 
core assumptions, mm -hmm. um, perhaps almost in the mathematical sense. Yeah. What is the um, um, what what is theory and finance on that continuum like? Is it is theory um, the result of empirical observations from which you abstract, or is theory um, rather the result from um, say mathematical assumptions that then lead to propositions? Well, I guess the inspiration of a theory comes also from uh, empirical observations, right? So we have, some, we call them some stylized facts. Think about a bubble, prices are going up and then down, that we want to try to explain. But once we build a mathematical model, the mathematical model is just based on a set of assumptions that tend to replicate the salient facts about the world we want to explain. So it's both in your so it's inspired by what you observe in reality, but is built on a mathematical model which is self-consistent, whose assumptions tend to replicate uh, the salient facts uh, for us that we observe in reality. So theory has the ambition to build a mathematical model of human behavior? Usually yes, given the current paradigm, that's the, that's the, that's the status, so huh. yes. And is that feasible? Well, I think we've been, uh, we made quite a few progress using mathematical model in explaining, uh, in explaining reality. So um, I've, I think so. I think uh, uh, in the last uh, 40, 50 years, economics and finance have made lots of progress uh, using mathematics in explaining reality. So you build mathematical models to address these, uh, these issues. Yes. Um, it seems like quite a few of the variables that you include um, come with a certain degree of uncertainty. Yes. Um, how do you go about that? Yes, so therefore that's where the robustness comes into play. Uh, because there is indeed uncertainty about a lot of issues. I just gave two examples. Uh, the ones that the price of the food and the actual demand that is uncertain. But also the roads that are uh, available for uh, to transport the food are a little bit uncertain because during a flood you are not sure which road is flooded or which road is not flooded. And I think I can best describe uh, the how we consider the uncertainty regarding that. Uh, I think that's easiest to understand. That's if you go from A to B, and you have the fastest way is, for instance, 30 kilometers, uh, or you, you, it takes you one hour by the fastest way, then you can say, well, okay, let's do the fastest way. That's most efficient. It's cheapest. You are there the fastest. That's best for all. But if that fastest way does not have any detour, so even if that way is flooded, then you have to go back and you need to, f uh, to search for another way. Then it would have been better to take a, di a different route that's maybe a little bit slower, like five minutes slower, but that has certain possibilities for detours, which are, in the end, it's more robust, because if that road is flooded, you can take plan B instead of having only plan A. And in the same way, we incorporate well, uh, the robustness for the other aspects. So the uncertainty is mostly covered by finding a solution that even if the worst case takes place, you still have a reasonably good solution. What is the role of theory in your work? The role of theory is twofold. Yeah, it's twofold. So first of all, there are, uh, when you have a problem, it could be that uh, that type of problem has already been tackled to some extent, a sense in the literature. So you delve into the literature to see whether that problem matches with a similar problem. And if it does to some extent, you can use that model and extend it to your own needs such that you, uh, well, can solve the problem that is interesting for you. Or in my case, it is interesting for the single hunger lab. But there is a lot of research that has not been done yet. And for instance, the robustness part, there's a lot wo of work to be done in the robustness part because the robustness is an, it's a new field, a relatively new field. And therefore, the amount of work that's been done here is relatively low. And in order to apply it to a practical problem, you need to develop your own theory in order to be able to solve it. So you do need a certain level of the theory but you will always extend it because not everything has, well, it's a relatively new field, so you need to evolve the, the, the theory and need to extend it such that you can solve it. And therefore, you also give something back to the literature and to the theory. And that then involves um, developing modeling techniques or developing new models for new realities. Yes. So it's developing model techniques in order to tackle 
larger, bigger instances, because in the current times, big data, more data becomes available. So there's more data that you can invo involve into your methods. But in order to use all the data, you need to find smarter and more efficient solution techniques in order to, to tackle your model. So that's one thing that you need to do. And it's also possible that you just stumble upon a completely new problem that has not been tackled before to some extent, to what extent whatsoever. And then you need to think of models yourself and not only think about new solutions techniques. No, then you have to develop, first of all, your own model. And secondly, how to solve that model. That's also an important question. The practice learns from the fact that you put on uh, academic classes. And on the other hand, because uh, in practice that they can do things that are very clever, although never published. And then you can say, okay, well, but that means that this theory should be tuned or refined or maybe should reject it. And how do you then build theory from um, single observations? Or do you build theory from single observations, single cases? Uh, if you have a single observation or a single case study, then you sh uh, should be very, very careful and, very and, um, do and go in depth in, in, in very much detail because it's just one case. But in a certain situation where uh, some, some area is totally new, it, it can still be of value because then for the first time you, you dig in, in one company or in one hospital and then you get ideas how you would do that if you would have chosen four hospitals at a time or six. And after doing four or six hospitals on a certain issue, perhaps then you understand the issue so good that you can develop uh, like uh, 15 questions for a survey and you can send it out to 80 different hospitals in the Netherlands or maybe in Germany and Belgium too. We have started from this theoretical framework. This means that uh, this framework consists, for instance, of uh, three pillars. And based on the three pillars and, and the text of the interview, uh, we say, okay, this part refers to number two, this refers to number three. And you stay within that framework. And it might be that when analyzing the results of interviews, you find out that there are also a number of uh, uh, replies from respondents that do not fit at all in these three pillars. And then you get an idea, probably the problem is more complicated. We also need a fourth or a fifth philosophy or theory to really understand this situation. So the theory generates a framework or a code book perhaps? Yeah, a code book. You yeah, yeah, a kind of... Uh, uh, I think a code book is better than a filter. I, I think a code book, yeah, because that by the, the codes derived from theory, and, and I think that's the deductive way, if I'm right, then uh, I always mix them up. <laughs> then uh, that is the, the, the glass that you put on. And then whatever deviations you occur, that's where things turn out to be. Yeah, e either you can say we can refine one of the three pillars or the combination of the three, or you might encounter things that fall totally out of the scope of these three pillars in your framework and then perhaps it has to do with some other phenomenon or other part of the literature. Ah. Ah. Can you guide me through the, uh, the research process that starts from this, this corpus of literature that you have and then to, um, in the end, the, the practical advice to, uh, to policy makers? Yeah, well it always starts of course with a uh, with some research questions or with an observation or with an hypothesis. Uh, and then, um, uh, as in every research project, I start collecting the data. And the data, often in my case, are books, but not only uh, literary texts, also uh, the reviews of literary texts or the um, interviews that authors gave or uh, gave in, 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 uh, on public uh, stages or uh, the uh, discussions that they have on, uh, on social media. So the corpus always is uh, uh, about the different data, uh, a collection of different data. And then uh, once I have a research question, once I have a corpus, I uh, use a specific frame, a specific theoretical frame in order to analyze the data and analyze the corpus and interpret the data. Uh, and this theoretical frame can be based on 
one theory or several theories. On the, uh, d at the moment, I'm working on on uh, on experiences, and then I'm really interested, uh, for instance, in the theory of the philosopher uh, Hans Georg Gadamer. He can give me a frame that I can use in order to analyze my data, uh, and then I can, as I said. Um, observe some patterns in the data or some relevant issues that I can compare. Uh, uh, I can compare different data uh, from a certain perspective. Uh, and on the basis of that, I write my articles or a book or whatever, a publication, and then I can base my, let's say, advice or conclusions on arguments on the basis of this analysis. So do you then code literature? No, not exactly. Not in the sense that you have a huge corpus of data and then say, okay, these are all A and these are all Fs. Uh, but of course, you need some elements in order to make a comparison between different texts. Just there is some sort of generalization, if code is a form of generalization, uh, is needed, of course, in order to, s to show the differences and the comparisons between different texts. Yeah. What is the role of theory in this analysis? Theory is very important because theory means, theory helps me to put a frame, a perspective on this corpus, on uh, all the data that I have collected. Um, and theory, in that sense, sort of makes, uh, gives me a lens in order to see, hey, this is, this is popping up, this is relevant, this is interesting. And without theory, there is, I think, not a, um, uh, an interesting, you cannot make an inter uh, formulate an interesting question. So you need a, s a perspective, for instance, on experiences or on society or on what is migration or whatever. You need a perspective in order to analyze the data, uh, in this case, the literary data on, uh, on migration. So the theory more or less sets the, uh, the boundaries of where you're going to look yeah. and what you're going to yeah. collect. Yeah, and I think that is the case in literary studies and culture studies, but it is in, in, in many research uh, projects the case. And it always, uh, it most of the time, is not one theory. What makes you uh, an interesting researcher is wh when you can combine different theories that maybe have not been combined before and that gives you a specific position uh, to formulate an argument. Does your analysis also feed back into theory or is it mostly applying theory? No, it, if, if, uh, if I am a successful researcher, if I consider my work successful, it always is, uh, I would say, a dialogue with theorists. Uh, I'm very interested in, okay, if I start with this theory, for instance, Gadamer, what he has said about experiences in the 1960s, how can I use Gadamer in order to analyze my data, eh, almost 50 years later, and how can I be in dialogue with Gadamer in order to change his perspectives or his ideas and in order to make them more relevant for what I'm doing today. So it always is a, a discussion, a dialogue with theorists. So the <coughs> anthropological method allows you to <coughs> uncover reasons that theory did not generate? Yes. I think that's, that, that's uh, yeah, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. And still you move into the field with a kind of a, a preconception, an idea of what you will yeah. encounter. Yes, yes, of course. That's, al that's always, you know, when you do this kind of uh, uh, field work, it's always a tension because you have to go into the field um, and you want to find new things, huh? but you cannot go there without any theoretical frame. So you need a kind of a theoretical frame. Um, um, but of course it's interesting if you do this kind of research and you come there with your theoretical frame, that uh, af if, if you, you can also prove your theoretical frame wrong. And that's, that's, that's nice, mm. actually, that or, or that you can add something to the theory. You know, if you go to a, a field and you have a theoretical frame and you only find things that exactly fit in the frame, it's not, well, 
okay, it's an okay study, but it's more exciting if you find something more or something that is contradicting or, um, yeah. Why is it important to find things that go against uh, the body of research? Now, well, the, 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 um, the thing is, of course, if, the, it, it, well, it's not, a, mm, that's doing research all about. It's, so maybe you don't find it, but you have to be prepared for it. So when I teach my students, so, so if you go to the field, um, be, be, prepared, be prepared for a, a surprise. Because if you go there and you know already the answers, well, that's not doing research. You know, this kind of research, um, it's qualitative research. Yeah? We, always, we only, only work with qualitative data, so no numbers, no surveys, etc. So you have to be very careful yeah? because um, uh, that you really um, do not fill in the information yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to you go there with a certain preconception of it, but then, as a researcher in the field, you really have to be, I would say, as naive as possible, like a child. Just ask questions. So, what's going on? What what does it mean? All these kind of, and not just, um, yeah. So, open questions is very important, um, and not just like checking, like okay, this is this um, accords with theory. That's accords with theory. But just, huh? so the theory, the, your concepts are just like, what is it, like spotlights that you can, yeah, yeah. you cannot do without any theory, I would say. No. Some say it's possible, but I don't think so. so. But there's no hypothesis testing no, ambition. No, then. No, no, no. So you, you need a body of knowledge where you can stand on if you go into death with a smaller group of people but then you need the bigger picture. And that is very often provided by other researchers in other methods. So I need them. What is the role of theory in your work? Depends. Um, it, well, for the anorexia nervosa, I um, studied many theories on anorexia nervosa. So what is the the source, what is the reason, but also what could be done about it. And very often the idea that the source could be the family, for example, then the remedy is uh, family therapy. If uh, the, the theory feels, um, no, 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 it is just behavior, wrong behavior, and we have to reset this behavior, then you get a different therapy. So I studied all those theories on anorexia nervosa and with those theories in mind I asked my questions. Mm -hmm.